And then if you have a Bible, would you turn again to Haggai? Uh, two weeks ago, we started a little series in Haggai. And then we looked at chapter one and the start of chapter two. Uh, this morning, we're going to continue with the end of chapter two. And I'm going to read from uh, chapter two, verse 10 through to verse 19. Chapter 2, verse 10 through to verse 19. This is Haggai, who is a prophet who spoke to the people of God after they'd returned from exile in Babylon and Persia. And uh, he was encouraging them to get back to work on building the temple, basically. Uh, and that's what this letter uh, is about, to build God's house where he dwells amongst his people. So Haggai 2, verse 10. On the 24th day, of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with his fold bread or stew or wine or oil or any kind of food, does it become holy? The priest answered and said, no. Then Haggai said, if someone who is unclean by contact with a dead body touches any of these things, does it become unclean? The priest answered and said, it does become unclean. Then Haggai answered and said, so it is with this people and with this nation before me, declares the Lord, and so with every work of their hands and what they offer there is unclean. Now then, consider from this day onward, before stone was placed upon stone in the temple of the Lord, how did you fare? When one came to a heap of 20 measures, there were but 10. When one came to the wine vats to draw 50 measures, there were but 20. I struck you and all the products of your toil with blight and with mildew and with hail. Yet you did not turn to me, declares the Lord. Consider from this day onward, from the 24th day of the ninth month, since the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. Consider, is the seed yet in the barn? Indeed, the vine, the fig tree, the pomegranate and the olive tree have yielded nothing. But from this day on, I will bless you. As we come to this passage, which may have seemed quite obscure as I read it, I'm not sure. Uh, you may have wondered what was going on. But as we come to it, I want to ask you a question. Uh, whether you're listening in on Zoom now, or whether you're watching online on YouTube, I want to ask you, are you holy? Are you holy? I wonder what your instinctive answer to that is. If you've got a, a very um, tender conscience, you may well answer, no, I am, I am not holy at all. I'm not a holy person. But maybe you come to the conclusion that actually, yes, I am. I wonder what you would say. Are you holy? It's actually a very important question. It's very important because the Bible teaches us, for example, in Hebrews 12, 14, that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. In other words, if you aren't holy, then there will be no place in heaven for you. If I'm not holy, there will be no place in heaven for me. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Well, we're returning to Haggai this morning. And the Old Testament people of God, as they continued actually to do what God had told them to do, as they rebuilt God's dwelling place, uh, the temple, the house of God. It had been destroyed during exile in Babylon, raised to the ground. Uh, but the people had returned from that exile uh, a number of years prior, actually, to when Haggai spoke to them. And they begun their rebuilding work. They begun initially very enthusiastically under Nehemiah. Uh, and they'd even got the, the altar in place in the, the temple precincts, the temple area. Uh, 
But over time, their, their enthusiasm had obviously died down. They'd, they'd kind of given up, really, which was in some ways understandable. There was a lot of opposition from the people around them who weren't Jewish, uh, wanting them to stop, and, and sure enough, they had. Uh, but it was important in actual fact that they, they didn't. It was important uh, that they continued. So Haggai had encouraged them to do that, uh, and they got back to it. And they'd been back at it for, for quite a while now. They'd been back at it for quite a while. They'd been rebuilding the temple, rebuilding God's house, no longer concentrating on their own homes, which is what they'd slipped into. Uh, but then Haggai uh, comes along uh, with a question, particularly for the priests. He has a, a question for them about holiness or cleanliness and unclean cleanliness, being unclean. Uh, and it's, it's a question that we might think, well, what's this got to do with anything at all? Uh, there's a question uh, in verses 10 uh, and 11 and on into verse 12. On the 24th day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet. Thus says the Lord of hosts, ask the priests about the law. If someone carries holy meat in the fold of his garment and touches with that fold of his garment bread or stew or wine or oil of any kind of food, does it become holy? Well, the answer is no, it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, but why is Haggai answering that question, asking that question, sorry, and getting an answer from uh, the, the priests? Well, he was seeking to point out that holiness is not, at least under the Old Testament law, contagious. It's not contagious. Holiness cannot be transferred simply through contact with something that is holy. So you have a holy piece of meat there in someone's garment, in the fold of a garment, perhaps in their pocket. But anything that touches that doesn't become holy itself as well as a result. Not at all. Uh, under the Old Testament law, in actual fact, for any item to become holy, it would have to be purified according to the ceremonies of the Old Testament law before it would be considered holy in God's sight and able to be used uh, for God's service. So Haggai establishes that first of all, and then he asks a second question. He asked basically if the same was true of unclean items. So if something was unclean, could its uncleanness, its defilement, if you like, which made it completely unacceptable in God's sight and completely be unable to be used in God's service, was that uncleanness, that defilement, was that transferable simply by touching it? Or did, again, you need the ceremonies of the Old Testament law to make it unclean? Well, it's very different with something unclean, isn't it? The answer to the second question if you touch something unclean, is it the uncleanness passed on and then passed on from that to the next thing and that to the next thing and so on? The answer is yes, it is passed on. It is contagious, if you like. You didn't need any sort of ceremony to make something unclean. And that uncleanliness, that defilement would then spread and spread and spread through contact. In that way, it's very much like a virus, isn't it? We've got that so much on our minds at the moment. We're also desperately careful at the moment and being told to be careful not to come into contact with one another because the virus may be there. And if we come into close contact, the virus will be passed on. Well, uncleanliness works in exactly the same way Haggai is establishing. So think of it like this. We're doing a lot of hand washing or we're encouraged to do a lot of hand washing, aren't we, with soapy water at the moment. What's the way you do it? You, you wash your hands and you sing happy birthday through twice. I don't know if any of us are still doing that after six months, but that's what we were told right at the beginning of this pandemic. So you just thoroughly wash your hands with hot soapy water. We'll call that the ceremony, if you like, of making something holy and clean. And then you wipe your clean hands all over a dirty, oily rag from the garage. 
does the rag then become wonderfully clean just because it's touched your clean hands? No, nope. it doesn't, does it? It stays dirty. It's not been washed in soapy water, which would be what would be required to make it clean as well. On the other hand, if your hands are dirty from you know, touching that oily rag or changing some car oil or something or doing the gardening, and then you wipe them on a clean towel, what happens? Well, your hands don't get that much cleaner if there's no soap involved or water, but the towel gets pretty dirty, doesn't it? And if somebody else then picked up their towel, that towel, their hands would in turn get dirty and so on. That dirt, that uncleanness is transferable. So that's, that's what Haggai is established by going to the priests who knew the law inside out. Uh, they taught these things about holiness and uncleanness. And Haggai, straight after that, and we read it earlier, then tells the people something that they probably didn't want to hear. But he tells them. He tells them that three months to the day after they started rebuilding the temple, and we know it's three months because all through Haggai, keep, Haggai keeps saying the date at which things happen. But three months after the start of chapter one, basically, where he told them to get back to work, they start building the temple again. They're still unclean. And because their offerings are un because they are unclean, their offerings that they're making on the altar are unclean too. In other words, the fact that they are unclean uh, leaves everything else unclean. Uh, that was devastating news, I'm sure, for them to hear. The offerings that they were making in the temple uh, were not acceptable in God's sight. Uh, that must have been, like I say, uh, really hard for them uh, to hear. Really hard. But there's some key words uh, that are also mentioned in this passage to help us understand what's going on. And they're the words, from this day, from this day. They're repeated three times in this passage. So in verse 15, verse 18, and verse 19. The first two times that Haggai asked the people to think about from this day, is really asking them to think about how things were before this day. Uh, the day in, in question is, if we were to put it in uh, British bumps and and so on, the 24th of September. So think about what's been going on up to this day, the 24th of September. How have your fortunes been up until now? And they weren't, they weren't great up until that point. But then in verse 19, they were told what will happen from this day onward. What will happen after this day? So before the 24th of September, unacceptable. After the 24th of September, acceptable. Before the 24th of September, it was as if they were living under a curse. And the grain wasn't coming in, the wine wasn't coming in. They weren't seemingly being blessed by God. But after, he says, from that day, end of verse 19, I will bless you. So obviously something significant is happening on this day. Because before this day, things aren't good. After this day, God will bless. So it does beg the question, what is so significant about the 24th day of the ninth month here in this passage? Well, the, the clues are there when you look at the verses closely. First of all, verse 15 tells us that on this day, stone was placed upon stone. Then more specifically, verse 18 tells us that on this day, the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid. So for some reason, the laying of the foundation stone to the temple, which happens on the 24th day of the ninth month, the 24th of September, for some, day, for some reason, that was very, very significant. Uh, so a lot of the, the 
Old Testament scholars and commentators point out that the laying of the foundation stone in the temple had great ceremonial significance. It was effectively the key in dedicating the temple to the service of God. In other words, once the foundation stone is in, the temple is considered holy, acceptable in God's sight. It is then set apart for God's service and the offerings within it that are made within it on the altar then become acceptable to him once it has the foundation stone, the cornerstone it's sometimes called. With that foundation stone, the temple, the people in the temple, the offerings offered by those people could be declared holy and acceptable to God and his blessing would flow to them. In actual fact, this passage revolves around uh, the foundation stone and how it makes that which is unclean, unacceptable, unblessed, holy acceptable and blessed instead. Now that might all sound very interesting and quite technical. (laughs) Uh, Some obscure passage from the Old Testament about how a foundation stone was needed in an ancient temple in order for God to accept people's sacrifices, in order for them to be accepted and blessed in his sight. But it's important. It's important to us as well. It's important uh, because the foundation stone is actually a, a, a theme that runs not just through Haggai and the Old Testament temple, but it runs right through the whole Bible. Uh, let's just have a, a think about that theme especially as it moves into the New Testament, uh, the New Covenant, and we are, as the church, the New Covenant people of God. Uh, If you have a Bible in front of you, turn to the letter of 1 Peter. Turn to the letter uh, 1 Peter. And turn to chapter 2 in particular. I'll give you a little bit of time to get there if you're flicking through your Bible. 1 Peter uh, and chapter 2. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. In this letter, Peter talks a lot about being holy. Uh, We went through 1 Peter in bite size. Uh, Well, we started going through it. I apologise, it's got a bit stuck. It will pick up again at some point, hopefully. Uh, But one of the themes that runs through 1 Peter is holiness. It's a big theme. The holiness without which no man is acceptable in God's sight, no person. It talks a lot about being holy. And it talks about how we can be holy. Turn to 1 Peter 2 verse 4 and we'll read that. Talking about us, it says, as you come to him... That's as you come to Jesus Christ, he's a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious. This him, as you come to him in verse four, that's Jesus Christ. And how is he described? As a living stone. Now, Peter hasn't just plucked that kind of language out of thin air. He's plucked it from the Old Testament. He's plucked it from the likes of Haggai in chapter 2. A living stone. Uh, Then verse 5. How does verse 5 go on? You yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. So you read that verse and you see that God's people are being described like living stones. Jesus is a living stone. We're living stones. Uh, And what are they? What are we built into? Well, a spiritual house, a temple. Loads of links with Haggai. Uh, 
How else are they described here? Well, they're a holy priesthood. So in God's eyes, every one of his people is holy, sanctified, acceptable, set apart for God's service, a priest. That includes you. So you, if you're a Christian, are able to offer acceptable sacrifices to God through the living stone, because of the living stone, Jesus Christ. So what was happening back there in Haggai? They were bringing their sacrifices to the altar. They would give them to the priests to take to the altar, but God wasn't accepting them. They were unclean because the foundation stone wasn't in place. But from the day that the foundation stone is there, the cornerstone, the offerings that they make, that the priests make in the temple in Haggai's day become acceptable to God and God blesses. And that is a picture of exactly what happens with us in Jesus Christ. We come to him, the living stone, put our faith in him, put our trust in him. He is the stone on which everything is built. The house of God is built on him. And as we trust him, we are made living stones too. We are added to that temple. We're part of God's house, acceptable in God's sight because we're forgiven and cleansed of all of our sin. And the offerings that we bring, spiritual sacrifices, 1 Peter 2 verse 5, become acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Our offerings and we ourselves are considered holy in his sight because we've come to the foundation stone, the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. Paul, Peter continues his theme in 1 Peter 2 verse 6, for it stands in scripture, and now he's quoting other Old Testament passages, Psalms and Isaiah. Behold, I am laying in Zion. Uh, Zion is the hill on which Jerusalem was built. I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Isn't that wonderful? No shame in God's presence when we come to Jesus Christ, the precious chosen cornerstone. He has that sanctifying effect upon his people. Now, the foundation stone of the temple in Haggai's time was pointing forward to what we have in the Lord Jesus Christ, pointing forward to Christ who sanctifies us. Now, sanctify is it's a long word, that isn't it? A biblical word. It just means make holy. To sanctify something means to make it holy in God's sight. We are sanctified in God's sight when we come to Christ. Verse 9 continues the theme of, of 1 Peter 2 uh, and chapter 2. 1 Peter 2, chapter 2, um, two yes. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. And again, that's the effect of the foundation stone upon his people. Uh, let's, let's make a, a few applications from this uh, next of all. Uh, firstly, the most obvious application is you're never going to be acceptable to God if you don't build your life on the foundation of Jesus Christ. I asked at the start, do you consider yourself to be holy? Now, in one sense, of course, none of us are, because we still sin. But if you're trying to get holy in God's sight by cutting out your sin and being incredibly good, that's not going to work. The Bible says time and again, you cannot make yourself holy in God's sight. You cannot make yourself acceptable in God's sight. When God's word says in Hebrews 12, 14, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. It's not therefore telling you, therefore, make sure that you make yourself holy. Because we cannot do it. It can never be acceptable in God's sight, because as we learned from that illustration from Haggai about an unclean thing just has to touch something else and it becomes unclean itself and then it gets passed on. Just, just one sin in our entire life is enough to defile us forever, to make us unacceptable. And no amount of doing good after that will cleanse us so that we're holy. Holy. 
whatever good we do isn't acceptable in God's sight because of all the sin that makes us unclean in God's sight. We need to come to the cornerstone. We need to come to the foundation stone. Trust in him so that we are made living stones like him so that we're sanctified, made clean, so that we're acceptable and we're blessed. So firstly, you'll never be acceptable to God if you don't come to Christ for the cleansing of your sin. And that that sin is cleansed as he goes to the cross and his blood is shed for you and cleanses from all sin, making you holy in God's sight. But, But secondly, if you are a Christian, then really you can answer the question and should biblically answer the question, are you holy? with a yes with a yes not because you in and of yourself have done it but with a yes because you've come to christ to say no i'm not holy when you claim that you trust in christ is to say i trust in christ but he hasn't quite managed to do what he promises to do he hasn't actually made me holy and acceptable in god's sight There's a very important sense in which the Christian must and should ask the question, are you holy? With the answer, yes, I am. I'm not saying I'm perfect. I'm not saying I never sin. I'm saying I'm holy in the biblical sense of I've trusted in Jesus. He has cleansed me of all my wrongdoing. And therefore, I am acceptable in his sight. That's actually a wonderful privilege, isn't it? It's a wonderful thing. And it has another application, which is this. You could go one of two ways with this realizing that in Christ you are holy. I guess on the one hand, you could say, well, now that I'm in Christ, now that I've been made acceptable in God's sight by coming to the living stone, the cornerstone, I don't really need to worry about how I live anymore. It's all good. I can go and sin all I like because in Christ I'm holy. But that would only show that you've never really come to Christ at all. You've never understood what it means to repent of your sin and trust in Christ for forgiveness and cleansing of sin. No, that's, that's the wrong way to look at it. If we looked at it at that and said to the Apostle Paul, for example, this is how I see things, Paul would say, by no means. No. Uh, The grace of God in giving us the holiness of Christ is not a license to sin. Now, when we've understood our holiness in Christ properly, it comes with an accompanying desire to, to be holy in practice. To go out and do good. To love God and to love our neighbor. To be holy, not only in terms of our position before God, but in terms of our life too. And it means that you can actually, by doing good, seeking to do good, please God and bless others. Uh, Peter talks in 1 Peter 2 and verse 5 about offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Anything we offer up to God in our lives outside of Jesus Christ, even if we're trying to do good, isn't acceptable to God and and doesn't ultimately please him. But as we seek to do good in and through Jesus Christ, God accepts it and he's pleased with it. He accepts not just you as a person, he accepts what you seek to do for him and for those he has created, for other people. You can serve him. That's what it means to be a priest in God's house, to offer spiritual sacrifices. It's no longer going into the old temple precincts and offering up a lamb on an altar. It's going out and loving people around you, doing them good, caring for them, and God is pleased. Isn't that wonderful? Uh, We rightly teach that even all the good things we do are still tainted by sin, and they are. Often when we seek to do good, a lot of it is tainted with a sense of of pride, and that is wrong. But if we're in Christ, that sin that still taints it is cleansed, and the good that we have done is acceptable to God in Christ Jesus. 
and he is pleased. And that should be a huge motivation to us to go out and offer these spiritual sacrifices of loving God and loving one another. It will do good to those around us. It brings glory to God as he is pleased with what you do in obedience to him. So, are you holy? Are you holy? Yes, if you've trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ to cleanse you from all your sin. You are holy and you are now a priest in the house of God. The Bible, the New Testament teaches the priesthood of all believers. And because you're a priest, do what priests do. Offer those spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. Love God, love your neighbor. And he will be pleased. And he will say to you in Christ Jesus one day, well done, good and faithful servant. Shall we pray? Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the one who is the living word and also the living stone, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we thank you that as we come to him in repentance and faith, we are cleansed of all our sin. We thank you that we are made acceptable in your sight. As people, as persons, we are made acceptable. We thank you that we are are built into your house. We are added as living stones into that structure where you dwell, your people, the church. And we thank you that as those who have been joined to Christ in the church, we can now offer you spiritual sacrifices. We can perform those acts of love towards you and towards one another, knowing that even though they may be tainted tainted at times with, with false motives, nevertheless, as we seek to do them for you, they are acceptable to you. So, Lord, forgive us for not being the people we ought to be at times, perhaps often. And instead, remind us of who we are in Jesus. Saints, priests, royal priests, your children, and help us to live as such. For your glory, for the good of those around us, and for our blessing. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.